So I hope that this is a really rich evening for everyone, full of learning and discussion. And I'm going to um, introduce Rabbi Deborah Waxman in a few minutes, but first we're going to make Havdalah together, um, and then Rabbi Deborah will speak, and then we'll have lots of time for Q&A. So Rabbi Steve Seeger is going to help lead Havdalah. Um, and for those in person, we're going to hand out spices and grape juice and a candle and, it, and also handouts. And if you're on Zoom, um, Lila is putting a Google Doc in the chat, which has all of the blessings. And um, I invite you also um, to grab your own Havdalah ritual items. So uh, if you have a candle or any, any candle with multiple wicks or two candles, you can put them together to create multiple wicks. Um, and for the spices, you can use really anything you have handy in your kitchen. Um, yeah, so we're going to hand those things out and then make Havdalah. Turn the volume up on your mic. Oh, okay. Is that Can you hear better? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So before we move into Havdalah, I want to invite everyone to take one last big Shabbos breath. Havdalah is this bittersweet moment where we're leaving Shabbos behind, but we're also taking the sweetness of Shabbat into our week. And we bless wine and spices and fire in order to help us bring a taste of that sweetness with us um, to sustain us through the week. And Steve is going to speak a little bit before we do the blessings. Thank you very much, Rabbi Miriam. I just want to say that... Uh, I and all of Kohalev is honored to be here uh, this evening to be co-sponsoring uh, the presentation by Rabbi Debra, and also honored to be co-sponsoring uh, with uh, the Cleveland Jewish Collective and Rabbi Miriam, uh, which I hope will be the first of many collaborations uh, that we engage in. Can you guys hear me on Zoom okay? I, okay. So um, from a certain angle, it could be seen as pretty ironic that we're beginning an evening focused on radical inclusion with the Havdalah ceremony. Because some people might argue that Havdalah is one of the least inclusive prayers in all of Jewish tradition. In addition to the blessings that Rabbi Miriam mentioned, the final blessing mentions a series of distinctions between categories, the holy and the mundane, light and darkness, Shabbat and the rest of the week, and in the classical version of the prayer between the Jewish people and the rest of humanity. And um, from a, the 
perspective, from my perspective, in terms of radical inclusion, there are a couple of big problems with this formulation of the Abdallah blessing. Um, one is, is that you have a series of binaries that totally misses all of the expressions of humanity that come in between the edges of any, uh, any given category. So that's, that's one problem with this. And, and then the second problem, from my perspective, is you know, in the classical formulation, the distinction between Jewish people on one hand and the rest of humanity on the other. That is not, in my mind, an inclusive stance. So the Reconstructionist movement, very early on under the leadership of Mordecai Kaplan, realized uh, uh, that there was the problem with the, that particular distinction. And, and they simply made a decision to take that line out of the blessing. There is, and and uh, that has remained to this day in the Reconstructionist prayer book, uh, excised from the blessing. There is, no, there is no mention of the distinction between Jewish people and the rest of humanity. And that partially solves the problem, but it doesn't get at the issue of the, the problem of binary. And it also, in some ways, creates a new problem because um, we understand today that actually distinction and uniqueness is important to recognize across different kinds of experience, right? Because every person and every group has its own history and its own identity, and uh, we do not want to erase or ignore distinctions between groups. We want to honor them, we want to recognize them. So it turns out that there's a, the beginning of a solution can be found way back in Jewish tradition in the Zohar, in the mystical book of the Zohar from about 800 years ago, and there's a commentary in this book that says that blesses God. Yes, it's important to bless uh, the divine for distinctions, but we have to remember that distinctions also create the opportunity to bridge between the different categories and experiences. And so I think if we can put those two things together, this notion of bridging and the notion of, um, you know, it also, when you have a bridge, I think it implicitly also acknowledges that there's a lot of realities in between the two edges of the binary. And so I think that the two moves of the early Reconstructionist movement, and if we can borrow from the Jewish mystical tradition, together we can move forward as a Jewish people with the kind of radical inclusion that we're going to be talking about this evening. So I um, wanted to share that as we go into Abdallah. We have one more coming up. Um, and I'll, I'll add to what Rabbi Steve just said, that um, we've been doing Havdalah a lot at CJC, and we have been using the Reconstructionist blessing, which you may or may not have noticed. So we have not been distinguishing between Jews and non-Jews. Um, and we've also been using a poem, which we'll use again tonight, from Marsha Falk, um, which is all about uh, making distinctions in order to be in relationship, um, which I think is also similar to what Rabbi Steve was saying. Um, the last thing I want to mention before we really move into this ritual is that as we're entering the new week, we're also entering the Hebrew month of Iyar, which is a month of healing. And Rabbi Nachman taught um, that Iyar is a good time to harvest healing herbs. He wrote, at this season, fruits ripen and all healing plants increase in power, for the earth puts her strength into them at this time. And I, I mention this now because I... I want to acknowledge that for those of us who have been marginalized in Jewish spaces, and I include myself in that group, um, finding a Jewish space that feels like home can be incredibly healing. And I also want to acknowledge that healing isn't linear and it isn't fast. Um, and there's also a tradition that Miriam's well first appeared during the month of ER, and also that the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness during their 40 years um, from uh, after they left Egypt, that that first appeared during ER. And so they were sustained by this water and this well, or, or sorry, by this water and this manna over this journey. Um, and becoming a radically inclusive community doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, it takes practice. We're learning and we're unlearning and we're making new neural pathways. The like bio nerd in me wants to mention that. Um, and uh, it's not something we just like achieve and then we're done with it. It's something that we work on every day. And so as we enter ER, as we enter this month of healing, may we be reminded um, of Miriam's well and of the manna 
and may we sustain and support each other throughout this process of growing radical inclusion. Oh, oh yes, we, that would be ideal. Anything. Does anyone see a light switch? I do not. Okay. If anyone happens to spy one. Let us distinguish parts within the whole and bless their differences. Like the Sabbath and the six days of creation, may our lives be made whole through relation. As rest makes the Sabbath precious, may our work give meaning to the week. Let us separate the Sabbath from other days of the week, seeking holiness in each.
Marsha Falk. May blessing abound in the city and in the field, in the home and on the journey. Blessed be the vessel and the work of the hands, the fruit of the body and the fruit of the land. May it be a fruitful week. And I want to invite you to take a moment to envision what do you need in the coming week? What do you hope for? What blessing? I'm going to give you a moment to think, and then we're all going to say, may this be a week of, and we'll have cacophony as we all fill in that, that sentence with what we need. Um, and if you're on Zoom, I invite you also to say that out loud um, or to type it in the chat. May this be a week of so we have one more. Am I echoing? <laughs> Thank you, Laurel. <laughs> Laurel is our one of our main tech persons. Thank you for everything you've been doing tonight. Um, we have one more very short piece of ritual, and that is to count the Omer. Omer. So as we're heading into the new week, we're also heading into a new day of the Omer. We're counting the 49 days from Pesach to Shavuot, from liberation to receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai. Um, and the Kabbalists in Svat in the 16th century also added a layer um, so that each day corresponds to two divine qualities um, and the interaction between those qualities. So we will say the blessing, we will count, and we will name the qualities. We will keep it brief. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvotah B'Tzivanu Al Sefirat HaOmer Hayom Hamisha Asar Yom Shehem Shnei Shavuot Ve'Yom Echad LaOmer Today is 15 days, which corresponds to two weeks and one day of the Omer, which corresponds to the qualities of Chesed Sheva Tiferet, loving kindness within balance. So I'm going to really quickly introduce Rabbi Deborah Waxman and then hand it over. Um, she has a very long and impressive bio, and I'm not going to do that. And she's like motioning to me. I was not planning to do it, but also um, I'm just going to focus on the things that I think are most salient tonight. Um, so she is the president of Reconstructing Judaism, which is the central organization of the Reconstructionist movement. And in 2014, when she became president, she became the first woman and the first lesbian to lead a major Jewish denomination. And many changes have happened um, under her presidency, and I want to name one in particular, which is that in 2016, RRC began admitting students to the rabbinical school um, uh, who are in interfaith relationships. And the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College was the first and is still the only rabbinical school to do that. So that's, that's really big, and that, um, that matters what we're talking about tonight. On a personal note, 2016 was also the year I began rabbinical school at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. And so I've only ever known an RRC that celebrates intermarried students and rabbis, and that has been such a blessing for me. Um, as the child of intermarriage, I never felt my Jewish identity was in question at RRC. And two of the people in my cohort uh, are intermarried, and these are two people who I met at RRC who I would not have met otherwise, and who I count as some of my closest friends, and who are now really amazing rabbis. Um, so really great for me and really great for the Jewish people. Um, I've also only ever known an RRC that is led by a strong queer woman. And um, an RRC with many women and queer students and teachers. And it was such a blessing to become a rabbi in that setting, to see my identities reflected in my teachers and to be emboldened as a woman and a queer leader. And not all of that is due to Rabbi Deborah, but certainly a lot of it is. Um, so thank you for that. And without further ado, Rabbi Deborah Wax.
so happy to be here with all of you. And I am so delighted that my uh, visit to Cleveland is, is the opportunity for this, this collaboration to happen. It's very interesting. What brings me here is a big conference that starts on Monday that is uh, by JPRO, the Jewish Professional Association and the Jewish Federations of North America. And the theme is collaboration. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lovely little consonance there. Um, and I've said to, to Miriam, that is, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's just, it's an interesting thing to be in leadership when people read your long bio. Um, and it is a really, any, if I had, what, 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 the mask helps because I don't never know what my expression is supposed to be. Um, <laughs> and it is really, really moving me with an introduction like that, with, with, with that is so meaningful. And so sh I just want to, in addition to the, the recent history, I, I want to um, acknowledge my 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 longtime friend and colleague and what, one of my teachers when I was at RRC. Steve's last year was my first year, so there's, there's a, just a beautiful wholeness here. I, I I often do not speak from notes, and I have uh, some notes tonight because this is the first time I'm talking on this particular topic. I, I've talked about it. I've this, uh, uh, inclusion is a part of many of my talks, but I, I'm so grateful to Miriam for the to Rabbi Miriam for this invitation to really focus in on radical inclusion. And one part of it comes out of uh, we recently had a movement wide convention of the Reconstructionist movement. In fact, um, uh, um, Cleveland and Carl Halev played a really essential part in that convention because. Hallie, thank you. So Hallie Barnett was one of, was one of the co-chairs of the convention. It was tremendously successful, and for me, really one of the high points was a, a panel on creating inclusive communities that was so full of wisdom and so full of Torah that I didn't even bother to take notes because I knew I was going to listen to it and read the transcript over and over. And that is actually available to all of you, and, and we can send that link out afterwards. And so this is my effort to really draw on everything that um, I have been teaching and all of the things that I have been observing and that we've been trying to put into practice at the rabbinical college across the movement and especially some of the learnings of, fr from that panel. And where I will end was with a set of practices that I think, that I hope that you will find useful in this, in this conversation. But I, I do invite not only, I, I know that there'll be questions about the content, I'd also really appreciate uh, feedback about the, the structure because I, I am, this is a little bit of a workshopping of, of this talk for me. Um, and this feels like really important Torah that I really want to be teaching at this moment in time. So I want to start with the founding thinker of Mordecai, of, of Reconstructionism. Um, and I do that both because that I have a, I do have, in addition to being a rabbi, a doctorate in American Jewish history, and I often start from an historical perspective. And, and that felt like a nice bridge um, between the folks from Kol Halev and the folks from CJC. Um, and the founding thinker of Reconstructionism was a man named Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, who uh, was started to really be very active on a national scale about 100 years ago. And I like to say about Kaplan that he was very, very bad at math. He was very bad at math, and this was intentional. Um, and what I mean by that is that Kaplan, that Kaplan would say that, um, at all times that it was possible to be 100% American and 100% Jewish. And he meant it with every fiber in his being. So let me unpack that just a little bit. Kaplan was one of many, many thinkers, many modern Jewish thinkers who was trying to resolve what they called the crisis of modernity that started at about the 1600s, like um, with, the, with the rise, with the beginning of the Enlightenment. And some of the crises, that they, some of the challenges that, they, that, that Kaplan and others, you guys are here in Ohio, um, the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary was founded here in Ohio, and uh, Isaac Mayer Wise was another one of these thinkers who was trying to address this. Some of it had to do with, in pre-modern times, Jews, we understood ourselves exclusively in a corporate identity. Our, our blessings are almost always in the, in the plural, in the first person plural, and that was both by our choice and and the, the the monarchs who believed that their authority came from a supernatural power they they also legislated that and we moved from that to becoming individual citizens and
and that really challenged Jewish identity. Some of it had to do with the rise of rationalism and what that had to do with the religious sensibility. And with that rise of rationalism came for the first time ever a kind of secularism. So where previously religion, the religious answer was the answer to everything. You know, what, what in the world, you know, from physics to how I'm supposed to behave to everything, the answer was religious. And for the last several hundred years, the, the, the influence of religion has been shrinking so much that it, it's, it's often just limited to ethics and morality and ritual. What this has meant, this is, that's been true for all, all religions. What this has meant for Jews and for Judaism is that for the first time in our, in our history, maybe, that there's been a separation of Jew and Jewishness from the religion of Judaism. So we like we're torn apart in certain ways, and that is, um, you know, there there are some benefits to that, but there's also a lot of confusion. And this was true 300 years ago, and this was true 100 years ago in Kaplan's writing, and this is equally true for us today, I think, in, in certain ways. So Kaplan, his primary audience was for the children of immigrants who were coming over from the waves and waves of, of immigrants who were coming over from Eastern Europe, and there's that apocryphal story that a lot of them when the ships would sail into New York Harbor, they would throw their tefillin, they'd throw their phylacteries into the harbor. That they felt like they had to make that choice between religion and Americanism, religion and modernism. And Kaplan was saying, no, 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 you don't have to make that choice. And he put forward this idea that Judaism is the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what he, his core insight was that the Jewish civilization and the Jewish people who created that civilization, it was, and we maintain to this day, it is expansive enough that we do not have to choose between different elements of, our, of, our, of ourselves. And what he, what he said, and what I carries through to this day, I think, is that we, we can, we are invited, we are maybe even charged to bring our whole selves to the Jewish community. And when we do that, there has to be this understanding that the community, it's not about like acculturation, come on in, it's about transformation. That when we bring our whole selves, the community is going to be changed in, in ways we understand and in ways we don't, but that that is part, that is, that is part of vitality and that, that is, and that there's a holiness that is there. So the one thing I wanna raise up a little bit more history is that this, this, this approach when, when he articulated it, and to this day, is, is quite distinct from a reform approach. Reform Judaism was one of the very first responses to modernity, and it took hold of that individual citizenship model and the, and the, the breaking away of the group and, and centered, founded this, the, the reform approach on the premise of individual autonomy, that whatever, what we, what I decide is the most determined. I, 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 I exist in community, but I, I, I will make my decision. My autonomy is the most important thing. And Reconstructionism insists on the need, uh, recognizing the needs and the aspirations of individuals and situates them within the context, situates us within the context of community. That, 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 is, that is balanced with, with the needs of the community and that it works because of that recognition that the community has to be changed. Now, we all know that that's not always how Jewish community functions, but that's the vision. So from the beginning, the Reconstructionist movement has, has been working very hard to expand the boundaries of Jewish community without watering down what it means to be Jewish. And it's felt like holy and it's felt energizing and it has been perceived as radical. Um, in, in fact, so much so that Kaplan himself was excommunicated at, uh, at, in, in, at, at, in 1945, and there are, uh, there are attacks and there are efforts to ignore and to efface. So, and I'll go back, and, and, we, and, and, and yet we keep going because it is holy and it is vitalizing and it is, um, and it is oriented, I think, as much toward the future as toward the past. So a little bit more about Reconstructionists. I said again that, uh, uh, that, that at, at its core, Reconstructionism is an approach, it's a definition, a 
of Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. And there are huge implications that arise from that. And in a reconstructionist analysis, there are, there are two constants across the millennium. Two. Two. I'll use one hand. Um, oh, um, uh, across, the, across the millennia of Jewish experience. There's the, the constant of the Jewish people, and there's the constant of change. We're always changing. And what we, what we understand is that our ancestors, they adjusted to the changes. Some of them were externally imposed, like the destruction of the Second Temple that got rid of everything we read about in the Torah, um, and that birth, helped to birth rabbinic Judaism. And some of them had to do with internal creativity, like the Omer and the layering on that, that we've just practiced. Um, our ancestors, they were not self-conscious about it. They attributed this change to God's will. And we, as moderns, and now today, postmoderns, we have an awareness of this change. I, I do think that this capacity, this orientation, this, this capacity for change along with an orientation for resilience is essential to our survival. It's, it is one of the answers to why when people say, how have the Jewish people been around for so long? I do think it is about this, this orientation toward change. Um, and along over the over the millennia, in the midst of all this change, our ancestors created this incredible storehouse of practices and of customs and of ethics and of food and of languages located in different lands. And all of this, that's what Kaplan called a civilization. It was the people who created it, and it came together in this beautiful amalgamation. And it, crea it created, I think, a, that using this language creates this very capacious response to questions that we sometimes get asked that, that, that are, are about segmenting and limiting. Like, it, you know, is, is, is Judaism a, a religion? Is it a people? Is it a nation? Um, you, when you talk about civilization, it, 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 the answer is yes. You know, it, 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 you, you, don't have, you, you can do that bad math to come up out to a profound insight. So what Kaplan taught is that where our ancestors did not have any kind of self-conscious awareness about it, we do. And not, it's not just about awareness so that we can look at it, we can study it, we can say, oh, look at those changes, but that we can be activists. We can take hold of it. And that we have the opportunity, even the obligation, to reconstruct, to um, adapt Judaism to the modern times in which we live, to bring in from other civilizations, obviously the American, but not only those insights that pulse with uh, truth, you know, truth maybe with a capital T. For him, it was significantly about democracy um, and the ways that that could open up and move beyond some of the binaries and, and certainly set aside some of the um, hierarchies that, that emerged. Um, and so we, we can we can set aside, we can reconstruct, we can we can take apart and put back together, and we can create anew, and that we are invited, we are empowered, we are we are even commanded. So I think you know I start off by saying Kaplan was one of many thinkers who responded to a crisis, and for sure he understood it as a crisis, and even more he understood this as an opportunity. There is an inherent intentional optimism uh, that infuses a reconstructionist approach. And, and ideally, it is not a naive optimism. It, you know, we, we, we see the challenges very, very clearly, and we choose to take this uh, affirmative framework and to look forthrightly at what is difficult and to try to create the greatest possible holiness, the greatest possible meaning for the world. So as I said, in a, in a reconstructionist approach, we make ample space for individual expressions and choices, and we insist on the centrality of community. Because if we're talking about inclusion, we have to be talking about inclusion in something. Um, I mean, that, that for me, that it, it's not just, it's, it is not just uh, words. It is, it's also about building something that is real. And I, 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 one of the things that draws me very deeply to reconstructionism is that we believe we find our humanity most powerfully in community, in abiding conversation with each other in willingly submerging our individual's desires for the benefit of others. Um, maybe always, maybe sometimes, but being willing to contract 
in order to make space for others. And that can only happen, I think, you know, as, as, as I said, that this conceptualization of individual and community is with that understanding that the community itself is going to be transformed. It is not, I'm very resistant to the language of welcome because that, 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 because that, that presumes a kind of assimilation. Hey, come on in and do it exactly the way that, that I do it. Look exactly the way that I look. And there's a, I think there's an interesting metaphor of, of, of like a, of a table um, where it's not like, you know, come to the table and you can even bring your, your food or your plate to the table. It's about, it's about the conversation. Should it be a table? Should we maybe go to the floor? Do we need to bring different chairs? Is every, are the chairs the right chairs? Wait, what are the food? What are the food? Wait, you know, it, it, it's, it's really about a lot of intentionality, a lot of process in the service of creating this, this future, you know, living ourselves into the future that we, that we want to see. And I think that when we talk about community, it's, I, it, I'm very energized by thinking of it as an axis. We're talking about it horizontally, us, concretely, in the room right now. How are we gonna navigate masks? What are we gonna do about Zoom? Like that, that, that conversation that we're gonna have about whatever, whether it's a, a small thing or the biggest possible thing that, that, that the visioning community committee is going to do. And I'm also talking about vertical community, our ancestors who came before us, and as much as we possibly can, the next generation. And we do that, the, the, the past, we do that significantly through study, through conversation, um, through, through, through study, through learning, through, through engagement with text. And that to bring their voices in, but Kaplan was quite famous for saying that the ancient authorities, halakha, mostly he was talking about, that they have, a, that we want to hear their voices. It's incredibly important to learn from them. And they do not have a veto. They have, they, they, the, the, the tradition has a vote, a vote, but not a veto. So I think one way that I think about this is about drawing the the margins into the center. In the morning service, the Shema, this prayer of unity, it's, it's, it's central in the service. And right beforehand, it, it, in, the, in every day, if you're wearing a prayer shawl, there's a practice of gathering together the four seat seats and bringing it in, bringing them together into one as, you, as we go into this prayer of unity. And that that's what we're doing, is we're trying again and again to bring the fringes into the center and, and transforming the center in that action and then doing it again and again each and every day because it's an ongoing process. So I just really quickly to trace a history through the Reconstructionist movement, Kaplan, 100 years ago, he was arguing against any authority who insisted that there was only one way to be Jewish. There were orthodox authorities who said, okay, you have to only be religious and it should determine every single part of your life. And there were, at that moment in time, there were reform leaders who said, you have to be religious, but it's only about, it, 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 you're, you're religious in your home. And, if, and, and, if, and if, you're, if you don't understand Judaism to only be a religion, if, for example, you were, you were a Zionist, like that, that wasn't the right way of being Jewish. And then there were the, some of the political Zionists who said, Oh, this is the only way. Zionism is the idiom of the modern of the modern times, and we should set aside all that religious garbage, and we should only be in the, using the political discourse. And there was this. This is what happens whenever there is contested authority, like there, like I said, there's been since the Enlightenment. Then there are a lot of loud voices shouting at each other. And so Kaplan, you know, he was obviously he was a rabbi, and um, he was really interested in religion. He was equally interested in um, a, a legitimating cultural Judaism, some of it is because he understood that, I love that I'm saying this in an art center, that he understood really clearly that aesthetics is a primary expression in the modern era, and he wanted to capture that and really um, use that to vitalize Judaism, and, and some of it is he was a cultural Zionist, and, and culture was a really important part of the Zionist program at that point, but he, he understood really clearly that the synagogue was not the only place to be Jewish. Um, Partly he wanted to change the synagogue so that it was more interesting, 
And he, and he saw that so, he understood that it was a problem. And he founded a Jewish community center where they called it the show with the pool. So they, they, they had the sanctuary, but they had a pool up on the sixth floor and they had a basketball court on the fourth floor. He wanted, it, he wanted to really legitimate all of that. He was founding the, that his synagogues in, in the early 1920s. The first, the first, we just celebrated the centennial of his, his first synagogue, which was a laboratory for him to experiment on all of these ideas. And that was right after women had received the ballot um, in, in America. So, so that, that general orientation toward democracy and that particular ex expression of it was built into a reconstructionist approach from the beginning. And that, that awareness and that commitment has meant that for the last hundred years, women have had a, 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 an invitation in, both in terms of religious egalitarianism and also in terms of governance. Um, women started to be uh, presidents of reconstructionist synagogues very early on, well before second wave feminism. And the reconstructionist movement was the first to have a lay leader who was the the, 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 the lay head of the movement, we were first to have a woman back in, in early 1984, also very, very early. And that awareness, all of this, as I said, seems to felt to folks in the movement to kind of grow organically. Before World War II, intermarriage was not a huge conversation because Jews were really quite segregated. There were housing, um, housing, uh, covenants and there were quotas at schools. And then after World War II, all of that started to break down relatively quickly. And that is when intermarriage really started to um, uh, become an issue. And the Reconstructionist movement understood very early on, very early on, that the decision to marry a non-Jew was not co-equal with the decision to exit the Jewish community. Much of the religious Jewish community said, oh no, that, that they, that's how they understood it. We're out of here. And, and, and if anybody tried to come in, they would slam the door. And very early on, as Reconstruction synagogues were being established in the 50s and the 60s, there was a lot of openness and, 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 a, and a lot of embrace that was codified in a vote by the lay people of the Reconstruction movement in 1967 recognizing Anne Bolinio descent, that a child of a Jewish, one Jewish parent raised in a Jewish home was Jewish. No questions asked, no need for conversion. And that with that came this recognition that being Jewish in our time is as much about choices as it is about biology. And this understanding, I think, really fueled the understanding 10, 20 years later around, I'm gonna say LG issue because it was really about gays and lesbians in the 1980s when it began when RRC admitted openly gay and lesbian students and it permeated out to the congregations in, in a whole process. There was, uh, trans was really far from anybody's mind and, and bisexuality was a little too liminal and there was a lot of anxiety about that, but that got processed and metabolized pretty quickly and, uh, and over the last 10 years, there's been just such an incredible penetration and acceptance of, of, um, of, of, of trans folks within, within the Reconstructionist movement. So at this moment in time, I think the most important work we're doing building on this is about this work on radical inclusion and, in, and to put it in Reconstructionist terms about reconceptualizing, maybe reconstructing peoplehood, which in, when, when uh, it was actually a group of classical Reconstructionists who brought that term to speech in the mid 1940s. And it was at a really ethnic moment in American life, also with a lot of that segregation. Some, even as the strictures fell away, there still was, a, I, grew up in a, I grew up in a place like very much like Shaker Heights, like you know, a, a, a dense ethnic enclave where it was like, you could just be Jewish by walking down the street, it was in the air. And so um, that moment is fading. We, we know that it, it still exists. I think maybe it exists here in Cleveland more than it does in some other places. But it is, as a general rule across America, that is fading and more, and, and so that, that's, those are, that is based on communities of descent. That's based purely on biology where there, you don't have to take any action to demonstrate that you're Jewish. And that we are more and more shifting into what we call a community of consent. 
we all have, we have countless opportunities to not be Jewish. We have so many ways to, in the wider world to seek meaning and to define our identities. And that anyone who chooses in any way to identify as a, as a Jew is making a choice, regardless of their parentage and regardless of their background. So we are shifting our, at, at, at Reconstructing Judaism, the organization I had, which includes the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, we're shifting our focus really away from an, a conversation about being Jewish, which is very much a conversation about boundaries and authority, and rarely generative, I think, and really focusing in on encouraging and encouraging people to do Jewish, and with this recognition that it could be, it, it is, it's, it's driven by what is meaningful and what is growthful. So for one person, it's going to be religious observance, and another person, it's going to be study, and another person, it might be social justice, and 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 it might be bits and pieces uh, and an amalgam for each and every. And again, re with that remembering that. We believe it's only possible to live a fully Jewish life in community. And we aim to support each person finding their individual path to an open and responsive community that we hope will be healing, the way Rabbi Miriam said, where we can all contribute our gifts and be supported in our wholeness. And I'll just, I mean, personally, that was my experience. I'm a child of the conservative movement, and I, um, I was considering rabbinical school about, just about eight or nine years after the conservative movement made a decision to ordain women. And I don't know that they still do it now, but the rationale that they offered then was that for a woman to be a rabbi, she had to become a halachic male. And I did not want to become a halachic male. I, I wanted to be, you know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't use like the term female or, you know, but like, I, like that just did not work for me. And that's how I found my way to Reconstructionism, which emerged out of the left wing of the conservative movement. So it, it, was, it, it felt like home once I found it, even though I'd never heard the word Reconstructionist. So it, gender had a lot to do with getting me there. And I was in the process of coming out, which I, it was another 15 years, I think. No, maybe 20 years before the conservative movement got there. So I was able to both be there as a woman, on my own terms, come out, and really, I feel like be supported to become the best possible person I could be so that I could become the best possible rabbi I could be, and to rise up so that I could ultimately rise into this position. And it's not a, I'm not a token. Like, I'm neither, we're, we're not a movement only of lesbians. We're not a movement only of women. I, I, am, I am representative of Reconstructionist values. And so, and it's so, it is really clear to me that had that not been possible, I most likely would have exited the Jewish community. Like this is, this is where not only did I stay, but I can be and I can contribute very significantly. So our, the work we're doing now is around justice commitments about centering the voices and experiences of Jews of color, non-binary folks. We're paying a lot of attention to class, people from different socioeconomic classes, and also abilities, um, and trying to make space for people with different abilities and, and be transformed. I think that's not the right language. I have to work on that language. And we're in addition to altering the community, we're also paying attention to the structures and the systems that work against equity and inclusion and trying to dismantle them at the same time. So this is where I'm going to end, which is how? How do you do this work? I mean, you talk about it, obviously, and you process, but and you you, you convene committees. But I think <laughs> there is a, and if you're a constructionist, you process, and you process, and you process some more. But I think there are some, um, there are practices. And some of this, I'm, what I'm offering is descriptive. We are doing it. And some of what I'm saying, it's, it's also prescriptive. It's, it's aspirational. It's what we want to grow into. And I think about this as Reconstructionists living, we were committed to living at the intersection of Torah, understood as expansively as possible, and the Jewish people. So we try to bring this to life through a set of intentional commitments. 
And I think my next project is to kind of like define like pieces of text and pieces of Torah to illuminate all of that. I think I'm gonna, that, that's what I'm gonna do next, but I'm gonna just list them for you here. I think it's that we enter into, in our, in our inter inter interactions and in our building of community, we enter into encounter informed by curiosity rather than certainty. We bring an interest in forming abiding relationships. Pretty certain I'm gonna bring a quote by Martin Buber there, maybe Levinas, but probably Buber. And mm -hmm. he talked about the I thou relationship. We cultivate the capacity for discomfort because in that communal transformation, it's not always easy. Um, we bring an insistence, an insistence on maintaining community across difference based on shared fundamental values, including that centrality of relationship. We have to at all times constantly nurture anava, humility, and chesed, loving kindness. It's a chesed shall be tiber. That's the, the, that, that compassion and loving kindness is tonight. And because we're gonna get it wrong, I learned this from our racial justice work, we're gonna get it wrong again and again and again. We have to bring the willingness to do tshuva, to make, re to, to make repentance, and to do tikkun, to make repair whenever it's necessary. And we have to bring that readiness to change individually and collectively. And we have to carry it all within a container of joy, of, of, of orienting ourselves toward joy. I think we do this work in the service of bolstering Jews and folks who are adjacent to Jews and seekers and drawing us all into communities that can help them, help all of us to feel valued and cherished and whole. I think we do this to honor our ancestors and to nurture ourselves and to model and to make space for the next generation of Jews and the people who love us so that that next generation can seed and nurture their own visions of Jewish community. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Debra. Um, for that last little bit, I feel like you can fly on the wall at our visioning team meeting. Some of you might feel like some of those, some of that language is very familiar. Um, and thank you also for, for giving us some Reconstructionist history and putting this in um, context. Um, we're gonna open it up now for Q&A. Um, so both for people um, in the room and for people on Zoom, um, I think I'm going to be fielding questions in person and Rabbi Steve's going to be fielding questions on Zoom so that we can make sure that we are equitably um, getting questions from everyone who wants to ask a question. Um, and in terms of making sure people can hear questions that are here on Zoom. Do you have a speaker? No, for the people oh. who are, should I repeat the question? Or do we want to ask people to come up here to speak with the speaker? Yeah. I'll repeat, okay. So um, I'll repeat questions that are asked in this room to make sure people on Zoom can hear. Great. Yeah.
going to contextualize it a little bit. So one of the things that Kaplan did, and it's actually one of the things that got him. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give a little bit of background and then and then repeat the question. This the thing that got him excommunicated is that Kaplan put forward the idea that we should set aside the idea of Jews as the chosen people, and um, and so Rabbi Michael is asking about that I how that might also inform this approach to, ju to, to uh, in inclusion. The main stump speech that I've been giving this year is about 100 years of Reconstructionism uh, from the founding of the, the Society for the Advancement of Judaism as that Kaplan Synagogue as a locus of experimentation. Um, and the, you know, the very first thing he did was, uh, he, it was founded in late January and in the middle of February, he said to his board, my eldest daughter is, uh, is 12 and a half years old and I would like to inaugurate, I'd like her to have a bas mitzvah, he, he said. And they said, sure. They said sure to anything he wanted. They were really serious <laughs> acolytes. And, <laughs> and six weeks later, she, five weeks later, she had, she, she, she had this ritual, which does not look at all, did not look at all like what most liberal bat mitzvahs do, do today. Um, and um, so I've been, I've been talking about all of the innovations that, uh, that have, um, flowed out of that, and I've been talking about where we continue to innovate and, and where what is particularly resonant at this moment in time. And some of it is new stuff, um, uh, like some, some of it is reworked stuff, like this um, abiding relationship across difference is, is, was, was, was a, we, it looks different in our day, but that was certainly Kaplan's concern. And some of it is new stuff, like the, the work that we're doing around racial justice, certainly LGBT inclusion. And some of it is this rejection of chosenness. I really believe that the repudiation of chosenness has incredible resonance at this moment in time, especially in the face of rising fundamentalism, and especially when most people who are not fundamentalist don't have a strong conceptualization of progressive religion. And so I think that what the separation, Kaplan, Kaplan actually had these incredibly complex arguments and he would like come up with a bazillion different reasons why there should be certain changes. And when he proposed shortly after World War II, he uses a man who lived through two world wars, like um, you know, he came of age in the first and then he watched the second happen. And when he proposed shortly after the second world war to set it, Aside chosenness, he did not make a particularly complex argument. It was entirely on, on, an, on the grounds of ethics, which was a deep preoccupation of his. And he basically felt that there was no way that the assertion that Jews were the chosen people could stop, could, could, could fail to descend into a kind of chauvinism. And he had seen chauvinism rise into oppression and rise into destruction and rise into genocide, and he wanted to weed that out. And I, and what he, but, but he wasn't saying that there, he, and he insisted nonetheless that Jews have a vocation. We, they're, that, they're, that, 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 that therefore, with that setting that aside, we should stop being Jewish, that there's, that through our distinctiveness, through this um, coming together to be in, in community and in our, ritual practices and in our communal collaborations, whatever they look like, that we, that we are, look the, the point of being Jewish is not to be Jewish. It's not an end of itself. The point of being Jewish is to be a good human being, to be a good, in, that to recognize our interdependence with each other, Jews and non-Jews and the whole planet and to increase wisdom and to increase equity and to increase justice in the world. And, and being Jewish gives me a structure and a community and a set of practices to, to do that holy work. And that can happen even as I affirm that other people who are on their own paths are equally valuable. So I do think that, I certainly think that it's incredibly important when we are surrounded by chauvinism to champion this and to unpack it and to explicate it further. And I have to think about whether and how it informs this. The hesitation I have is it's, um, it requires explication. 
And so you invariably fall into didacticism, which is a real reconstructionist uh, <laughs> tendency and one that I'm sad to say I perpetuate rather than break apart. I brought some materials and there's a, one of them is this uh, um, like picture filled brochure that has really good words in it, but it's mostly pictures. And I'm like, look, it's finally more images than words. Like it's just not our strong suit at all. So I don't know how, like where I, where I was able to like distill, even if I want to add text to it, I was able to distill the other things into one sentence. I don't know how to do that yet with chosenness, but I think, and I think you're exactly right that it is, for me, for sure, it's a really animating principle. I, so I'll keep chewing on it. Um, let's see if there's anything from here. And then... I don't think anyone yet on Zoom is asking. I don't see any. That's lovely. Um, <laughs> in, in the spirit of inclusion, I guess, just thinking about. That, I, okay, so, so uh, what, what's your name? Oh, Jenny. So, what Jenny said was, we're not, we're not Jewish because God chose us, we're Jewish because we chose each other. I absolutely love it. I, I think it's partly true. <laughs> Anybody want to help? Like, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's hugely true. I just, I, I, and I think, I think, I think my, my, the reason why I don't think it's only true is, is it has to do with like the, the past because we don't get to choose our ancestors, you know, like, um, so at least biologically. Yeah, you know, so maybe we do. Maybe we do. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I take that back. Scratch that. Um, and, and, so, and there was a distinction in there because I, I said that God chose us, but that we choose each other in this sort of active. I think that's. I love it. I love it. I'll, I if if I I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm absolutely not saying no. no, no I, I love I just, it. Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, <laughs> um, I didn't. I mean, because this was about radical inclusion rather than like, than like theology, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about um, reconstructionist, concept, concept, uh, reconstructionist conceptualizations. Say that five times fast yeah. um, <laughs> with, uh, of, of the divine, and uh, but kind of implied in the setting aside of chosenness is. And, and you know, you heard me say Kaplan was wrestling with rationalism, and he was really interested in harmonizing religion and rationalism. So, for the most part, reconstructions don't groove on a supernatural God. It's much more about um, there's there's space for like a transcendent divine, but it's much more about um, God is the power that makes for salvation. God is the the source of uh, the wellspring of life and the source of creativity, and so. Um, and that really worked for me. I mean, I remember when I was thinking about trying applying to rabbinical school, and I had a friend who was Catholic, and he had chosen between he was seriously thinking about becoming a Jesuit priest. And in the end, he he felt like his vocation was to become a husband and a parent, but he was really, really interested in religion, and all he wanted to do was talk about God with me. And I had no capacity. I was a very Jewishly involved person who went to synagogue every single week, and I had no capacity to talk about God. And that was a little confusing to me, but it made so. I mean. You know, there's a joke. Some people go to synagogue to talk to God, and some people go to synagogue to talk to Goldberg. And I, I mean, I sang all the songs, but I was really there to talk to Goldberg. And I, I didn't know how to talk about God. And, but I thought, I say it's the Reconstruction, so I don't have to talk about God. And I take the train down for, I was living in New York at the time, and I take the, take the train down to Philadelphia. Uh, and I'm, I don't know that much about Reconstructionism as I'm applying this, which is very funny and ironic given the, the position I now hold. And so there is this book that, that we all read called Exploring Judaism. We read the first edition. You guys probably read the second edition written by Rabbis Jacob Staub and Rebecca Albert. 
and it's a very nice primer about reconstructionism and the whole train right down i'm reading through it like what if they ask me something and what i should have done was actually read my essay that i'd written several months earlier because they didn't actually quiz me on reconstructionism they, they, they a lot of us were finding our way into reconstructionism but they look they look at me um and they say, this person, they said, well, so-and-so isn't there. Art Green wasn't there that day. So-and-so isn't there. I'll ask his question. You find on the admissions committee that they, they each person has their own question. And they said, so, so what's your conceptualization of God? And I'm like, and I literally, I'm sitting there like, oh my God, these are the constructions. They're not supposed to ask me about God. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I don't really have an answer. I mean, uh, it was really chaplaincy work that pushed me to develop those conceptualization and that vocabulary. And so after a panicked minute, I said, I see God in the faces of my family and friends. And they said, okay. And, they, and we went on. And it was, <laughs> and, 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 and I'll tell you the whole story. I, I happened to leave my um, purse in the building. And my plan was to have dinner with some friends from college and then go back to New York. And I didn't have my purse to get on the train. Mm. So I stayed over and, you know, this was well before the age of cell phones. And I called the next morning and I, 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 I left it there and I came. Oh, so, so I was waiting for my friends to pick me up. Like I left the interview room and within five minutes, like all of the interview people had piled out. And the next morning I came and the Dean of admissions said to me, I might as well tell you now, rather than send you the letter, you're, you've been accepted. And so, like, so clearly, that like, I thought, oh, I guess that answer was okay because they didn't have to sit around and discuss it. So, that imminent, that so now I know I have the language that that's that that is God. Uh, that's an imminent experience of God in community. I think it's incredibly compelling, as that story suggests. The reason I want a little bit more, and I and I want to figure out how to just decorate that gorgeous uh, saying is um, it's about limits. It's about the hubris of humanism. It's about the risks that we will justify in, in, in a way that could lead to the excesses. Well, look what's happening. In, I, you know, I was going to give an historical thing, but I'll just say, look, look what's happening across the ocean. So I, I do want I want to be articulating and reaching for and making the case for anava, for, for humility, and, and for the recognition that, 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 that we err. So, so that's, that's, that's the anxiety of that. that. So, but, and I thank you for the beautiful framing. Again, say if you have a question later. Um, I know they're invited in the chat, but maybe you'll get in the chat. Okay. No, I mean like verbally. Oh, verbally. Oh, oh, to me, oh. I'll be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can't. I actually brag to Miriam. I'm really good at including the people yeah, yeah, in yeah. chat. Hadra, <laughs> I'll look to you here. Um, any of you who are zooming in, we're so happy you're with us. And if you have any questions, I'd be so happy to answer them. Sure. 
Sure, sure. So the Adina's question is about um, references my, my our colleague and, 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 and friend, Rabbi Maurice Harris, who is uh, associate director of our thriving communities department, uh, which is the group that works with affiliated communities. He's also our Israel specialist. He's very wise. He's written several books. Um, and he described Reconstructionism as uh, an experimental laboratory for American Judaism. And there was a request for some, and so, and, and an observation that that there are failures as well as uh, successes in, 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 those, in that experimentation and a request for some reflection of, of, of some of the places of experimentation right now. So um, one is initiatives like the Cleveland Jewish Collective. Um, like I would actually say one is Kolalev and, uh, and I mean for a lot of, not throughout all of history, there were a lot of different ways that synagogues looked. You know, there, there, there were storefront shtibles and, and, um, and there were um, traveling experiences. But, you know, in the post-war American landscape, synagogues were buildings and campuses. So one is, one is that, that ongoing experiment of what does it mean to be a community without a building? Like, is it the conflation, it, like, our, about only about half of our communities own their own building. Some of them are new, that the buildings that they built, more of them are buildings that they retrofitted and converted. But so 50% of our communities, probably even more, are, are, do not make uh, space co-equal with community. And that's an, that means that, that takes a lot of work. And that means it's a lot of, uh, a lot of recreation again and again. And, the, and that's been, there's been incredible opportunities during the pandemic and also some challenges. So that's one. Um, this is also an experiment of the hy hybrid is definitely something we're working on really, really hard. We did our convention that I mentioned it is entirely as a multi-access convention. We worked really hard to make it a very, very positive experience for people who were streaming in. We had some things that were only for people online, including a Shabbat service across time differences. All the, I mean, Hallie's, I, I think Hallie's seen some of this. All the reviews that we've gotten is that we succeeded at it, and it was incredible incredibly resource intensive, both in terms of money and in terms of staff, on staff and on volunteer energy. And we have a commitment. We understand that the future is hybrid and we're not going to do it that way again. So like that's just, if that didn't that didn't fail, that succeeded and it's not sustainable. So that, that kind of, yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Some of it is about like the Cleveland Jewish Collective and, and, and seeing that, that, that we, and Miriam is not the only RRC graduate who is seeding a new community. In fact, did you get an order back? You got a little, you got a permission back? We, we have a, we have a, a, a fund to uh, promote innovation and uh, it takes a lot of different expressions, but three of the five of you, of your class, I think, got, 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 got at least a recognition. There's a, a um, Rebecca got the big one, and, and Donna got one of the little ones with you. So you know, so it looks like some of it's about. So we're we're, we're actively. So these, this goes not only to RRC students, but to liberal seminary students. We're look, we're looking to kind of inform the entire sector. Do you want to talk about what your what, what, what was it for this? It was for this, right? So we a little bit of funding for this. Uh, Rabbi Rebecca Hornstein has a, um, she's a, a, a soferet and she uh, creates um, beautiful, beautiful ketubot especially, and she created a, an initiative that was about rituals for revolutionaries. So it was about like, like kind of like premarital counseling. Do you want to, you can, okay. She's my classmate, so, and friend, so I, I know her work well. Um, she is, she, before she went to rabbinical school, she was a community organizer. She um, has a lot of, of history with uh, labor organizing as a Marxist. And so her whole, what she's doing is um, people who maybe question the institution of marriage and also want to get married, how, um, how do you make that mesh? And so she has, she does counseling and she uh, has classes that she runs. Who are questioning that? As and, that. and then they and, and she goes through a process of ketuba creation with them as well um, as they get ready to get married. So and then Rabbi Donna C 
Campus, who also graduated last year, um, she has this extraordinary commitment to, narr she has uh, some previous training on this as well, to narrative as, uh, as, a, as a pathway toward both peacemaking and community building. So she got funding to do oral histories of um, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women in Jerusalem for them to tell their stories. And it is in the service of, of peace building and community building. So that, that, that's some of it. I would say um, the decision about uh, to admit and graduate students who are partnered with non-Jews is a big experiment. Um, it's, we, it, it, it didn't feel all that risky. It felt like, it just felt like the right thing to do, I think. But, and, we're, we, but, and we didn't know how it would work out. You know, there was a question, would, would graduates get jobs? That was a question when I, when I was coming up as a queer rabbi, would we get jobs? Um, one of the people who got an honorary degree, this, well, was supposed to get it last year, um, and we, we finally caught up uh, at convention. <laughs> we, did, we did a whole bunch of honorary <laughs> degrees. It was really, really, really moving. It was really powerful. And was, was the first out rabbi to get a congregational job. She started as an intern in 1994. And when she graduated in 96, 95 or 96, they hired her uh, three quarters time. She was a second rabbi. And she just retired from that job. But it was, I mean, like the buzz of like, would she be able to, would any of us be able to get jobs? So we had that question. And the answer has been resoundingly yes. Um, and that, that, that doesn't mean that. Uh, every, even Reconstructionist community would necessarily hire all of them, and they have gotten extraordinary jobs. Um, and so that, so that, that continues to be an experiment. And I just recently got, you know, I was, we and I was, were very viciously attacked, and that was six years ago, six, seven years ago, and, uh, you know, it continues. I, I, it was, I mean, I kind of asked for it. I, I asked for engagement and got Unbelievable dismissals, you know, from a from a from a, an important voice in the Jewish communal landscape, um, who went out of his way to say that he didn't think that Kaplan would be Reconstructionist today. This was, it was just it was really it was it was really sweet. Um, so um, so I, let's put that. I would say the biggest experiment that we're engaged in is about no litmus test around Israel, uh, which. And I, I'm aware that I'm standing in, in Cleveland and that Cleveland in some ways is a little bit more conservative than some of the big cities with, with big Jewish populations, certainly on the coasts. And um, we have a requirement that our students study in Israel. It's been a little hard to enforce it in the middle of the pandemic, but we, we our students, um, we have built a program out an intensive summer term that maximizes time in Israel, spent with Israelis, learning about Israeli culture, Israeli life coming. It was created with a, a secular yeshiva, Bina, which is the most mission aligned organization I can think of. And we do not, um, we do not mandate a particular stance on Israel or Palestine among our students. And that is um, a, a very live issue in, in the Jewish community. And how that one's gonna unfold. I mean, so far so good. Uh, and I, I guess one other thing I'll put it forward is um, make sure Zoom people can hear me. I just want to be explicit if you don't mind of what you were just saying that like there are many students at RRC who are not Zionist. Yeah, that was implied, and I'm, I'm absolutely, absolutely appropriate for you to make it explicit. And I think the last thing I'll just, I'll, I'll, the last example I'll put forward is our whole community, our whole structure. This is a little geeky, but um, denominations in America, Christian and Jewish, are a seminary as a separate organization. The professional associations of the graduates of those seminaries, so rabbis and cantors and educators, we, we are mostly just rabbis and then congregational unions organized around those, um, th 
those, those principles. And the Reconstructionist Movement, because we are founded on American soil and are relatively young, all things considered, we were the last to kind of enter into that denominational structure, and we've really kind of exited out of it. Um, and that was partly through the merger of our congregational union and the rabbinical college, and that was that, that was mostly to significantly to deploy resources better, and to deploy those resources in a way that we could raise up Reconstructionism as a methodology, as an approach for the benefits of affiliated communities and also the, the wider Jewish world. And we do that certainly through like, you know, Reconstructionist rabbis who serve a community like CJC. We do that very significantly through our website Ritual Well, which, which has about 320,000 unique visitors a year and about 900,000 unique page views. And that is about that is about individuals on their journeys trying to find language of ritual. And, and again, our goal is to always try to orient them toward community. Um, so, um, so that's an experiment because we kind of can't win. Like the, the, you guys live in Cleveland. There are a lot of really big Jewish philanthropies here. They, many of them say, here they mostly fund locally, but the, the big Jewish philanthropies that are significantly setting the agenda for the Jewish community, they certainly don't like the Zionist piece. They're kind of anxious about the queer piece. They, they're pretty anxious about the non-Jewish partner piece, and they, they, and they like to say we don't support denominations. So we, we can't win if we say we're a denomination, and they're not convinced by when we say that we aren't a denomination. And, and, we, and I, am, like, I, I, I perpetuate Kaplan's bad math. I am trying to shatter binaries and, and have it both ways. Um, but whether we will, we're not going anywhere, which is a good thing. I think, were you, were you in Portland? Uh, a couple of years ago, I was worried that we weren't going to make it. And I feel pretty confident that we're not going anywhere. What I would love, I don't want to become a big, big, big movement. What I want is the infusion of resources so that A, we are better known, and B, that we can teach this, that we can teach the practice, like all the work that we're doing and the practices, that we can, we can, we can share it more widely with the, 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 the larger Jewish community. And I don't know that we're gonna be able to track the resources that will, will help us to take that exponential. I'd like us to take the exponential step, not again, not around size, but around influence. And, that's, that's a big experiment. Can you talk a little bit about what communities like CJC and Kohalab can do on a ground level to um, embrace this value of the, uh, radical inclusion? Like a couple of examples of specific or, or what you've seen other communities do to embrace that. Such a great question. Oh, um, what like ex examples, practical examples of of how to bring this practice of radical inclusion to life? Um, so some of it is about. Um, who gets in the door and how they get in the door. Uh, and, and what they find when they get in the door. So some of it really is about reading, reading and about speaking to people you don't know and about uh, that stance of curiosity rather than, than, than judgment. We have, a, I have a board member, I think it's, I think it's, I'm, I'm, she's, published this, so it's fine for me to tell the story. Who's a, she's a Jew of color, she's a Latina woman, longtime member of her Reconstructionist synagogue, uh, former board member there. And she, in fact, a variation of this happened at convention to someone else too. She went to synagogue one day, uh, and there was a, also a longtime member, but who was not at all active, and who had never seen her there before, and who came up to her and said, welcome. Let me tell you about the synagogue. 
let me explain Judaism to you. you know, so that, that kind of, um, you know, what, what was intended as a, as a, as a welcome, and, but was, it was such a slap in the face. So help training people to have this, just a, um, to set aside the certainty, you know, to, to be open, but in, in a way that really is, is capacious rather than shutting things down. I don't think I have to have a conversation here with you, but it's, sometimes the conversation is about security guards and profiling. Some of our Reconstructionist congregations, um, especially the ones who, ha who have their own buildings, there are, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's. I want to have that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a relevant conversation? So I mean, yeah. so that, so so let me tell you something. The Jew, I'm so excited about this and to, to talk to this guy um, at the conference tomorrow, or Monday. I, I'm I'm a belonging ambassador. Um, so it's this really interesting collection of Jews of color and uh, including Mizrahi and Sephardi Jews and queer folks and. I don't think there's. I don't think they're tracking like interfaith as a as a, as a, as, a, as a category. And I think I'm there because I'm a co-chair, and I think I'm there because I'm queer, but I can't quite tell. Um, <laughs> so, but, but I'm really happy to be there. I'm really happy to be there. So I met. There's someone joined. We had our last meeting last week, and the Jewish Federations of North America has just hired a black Jewish man for their security team to bring a racial equity lens to security conversations with Jewish communities across the planet. And this is a man who has a law enforcement background and who just came from Avodah, which is a very progressive organization. So I don't have chills when I'm talking to you about, I can't wait. And I was like, oh, I'm chatting him like, hey, can we meet? Can we talk? Like, and, and, and so we just, as I said, 460 people at our convention and we work incredibly hard with Secure Communities Network, which is the agency that liaises with the Jewish Federation of North America and and the federal government to provide religious communities security, but it and it is overwhelmingly. They do a lot with black churches. They do even but they mostly work with the Jewish community and and they have to be doing more and more. Um, so we talk to them a lot about how do we um, how do we keep ourselves safe and how do we avoid profiling? And this is the second time over we've had this conversation. Our last convention was in 2018, three weeks after the Pittsburgh shooting and the Reconstructionist community was the community at, at drives me crazy when they just talk about Tree of Life as if it was one congregation, it was three congregations and it was the Reconstructionist affiliate that was celebrating Mahaya Shabbat. So, and I was just with them right before convention, and they were doing remarkably well. They're totally still traumatized, and they're doing remarkably well, both are true. So how to, so we, I think we, it, you know, and it had some intersection of, in, in um, 2018, it was about uniform cops because of the things were so, but they, but they were outside on bicycles and not in the building. And in 2022, Everything is plain closed. But this time there was like someone, I don't know if you noticed that guy who was sitting by the registration desk. Like there was someone who was always centrally located and a handful of other um, uh, people. And we spent hours, Rabbi Maurice, who also has the security uh, portfolio, spent hours explaining our values and our principles. And they said, okay, here are the recommendations that we want to make. And, Tell you this, it's, I, 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 it's um, I'm have we, we are. So one of and this is to CJC people, and this is so that call up people can feel good about this. One of the things about being affiliated <laughs> with a movement is that you have voices, you have you, you have seats at tables that no one individual and no one community can gain access to, and so your perspectives and your priorities are brought to these larger national conversations. And I, t 
take that and significance. It's often me. Sometimes it's also the head of our, our, our rabbinical association. And I take that responsibility very, very seriously. My favorite table is the Jewish Social Justice Roundtable, um, organizations that work either exclusively or partly on social justice to Kurnalam issues. And this is a very collegial organization. And I am having, a, I, I've been trying to encourage the, the CEOs the, of, the, of, the, of those member organizations to talk to the secure community, community network. And some of them, because they are so convinced that it will only be about profiling and it will only be about um, guns, that they will not have the conversation. And the single greatest, the, 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 two, the two greatest safety measures that they start with that are so important, one is have an escape plan for any kind of problem. Certainly, you know, we all saw Colleyville, what happened, like, you know, that, that, that is certainly, but it's also, you're not gonna believe this, but we got evacuated last week because there was an odor of gas in the basement. And it was actually, it was, it was, it was, on, it was on the road, uh, and it was Pico's problem, and it was resolved within 14 hours, but we had to get everybody out of the building very, very quickly. And we were trained to do it. So there's, there's that, and the second thing that they say is, have a defibrillator. Have a defibrillator, like have a defibrillator because, you know, so, 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 so it's a sensibility that is at once about like overall safety and also values driven. So, I, so, to ha so to have those conversations forthrightly, but it's a practice, you know, like you have to have it again and again and again for the newcomer, for the person who doesn't come that often. Um, I think I'm going to read a story that was told in this inclusion panel that was so profoundly moving to me. Um, I think that the, the rich bonds of community building are essential to the inclusion so that when there is a break, so that when there is a rift, there's enough connective tissue that repair can be made. And that doesn't mean that it's going to look the same. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a scar, but so that there can be repair. And the story I'll tell you is from our congregation in Montclair, New Jersey. I was just there last week. They have a, they have a beautiful building. And they have a space kind of like this that they use both as their sanctuary and as their social hall. So after services, on Shabbos, they clear the, they push everything aside, they bring out some tables and they make Kiddush in the same place. And the rabbi tells this story it's shortly, it's, 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 it has its basis in politics, it's shortly after the 2016 election, that everybody is scattered around having conversation and all of a sudden the room goes silent because one man stands up and says to another, both of them beloved members of the congregation, how dare you say that and slaps the other man across the face. So our colleague, Rabbi Elliot Teverman, immediately, immediately runs over and immediately says to the man who has struck him, come with me, come with me, and they, they leave. And part of it, he tells, because we, we talked, I talked to him a little bit about it last week, the person who was struck it happens to be a very, very resilient person. So had it been a more fragile person, he might have needed to somehow divide himself in half, or he might have needed to have to attend to him. But I think he was able to make the decision that he did because he knew that that person, that he could, he could put that person in the number two slot. And he walks out with the man who has struck him, who, 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 who did the striking, and he says to him, what is going on? This is not who you are. And the man immediately breaks down and says, I'm so ashamed. I lost control. And they walk for hours. And they, and he says, you know, you have to do tshuva. And he says, I will do, and he and talks to him about how that can happen. They get back to the synagogue. Everybody's gone, except he's forgotten about his teenage son, who had just kind of settled down with his book and had waited for him. He's used to, you know, used to this. And he, then he makes the second call. And the two men talk and talk and talk over the 
course of the week and the next Shabbat, because they, they are a, they meet every Shabbos, the next Shabbat, they take the first Aliyah and they say, we are up here because this is an Aliyah of reconciliation. And what Eliot offered, Rabbi Eliot Tupperman offered, was like, you know, the holiness of having a container, a community where that kind of, you know, we are going to err. I mean, there's a beautiful teaching that God created 10 things before God created the world, and, and one of them was tshuva, because we were, were going to make mistakes. So to have this this container and this and these rituals that could allow for that kind of reconciliation. So I, I, I do think that the building up as much of the interconnective tissue it is, is a really essential part of it so that when there is friction, so that when there is pain, there is a pathway back to it. Uh, that, uh, let's first. see if anybody else yeah. before, before you speak. Yeah. Um, I'm just noticing the time. It was supposed to end 25 minutes ago. Um, if you're able to stay, we can, you know, welcome questions from people who want to stay, but also give people a chance to leave if you need to go home. Does that work for you, or do you also need to leave? <laughs> I, that's true. I am Rabbi Deborah's bride, so as long as I'm willing to stay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to add to the question that Laurel asked about practical tips that this um, video that, or this, this panel that Rabbi Deborah has referenced several times at the convention, a lot of it was practical um, tips um, from, it was a panel of four different people, if I remember correctly, who um, are involved in Jewish communities in different ways. Some of them are rabbis and who have different um, identities of their own and are speaking from their own experiences um, as being trans, being disabled, uh, being a Jew of color. Um, and one of the lines that like really um, stood out to me from uh, Rabbi Julie Watts Belzer, who is um, who's a wheelchair user, is that creating a space that's physically accessible is people often think that's the goal, but she invited us to see that as the, the bottom, the ground of what needs to be done. Um, and so I mentioned that only to say that like, I can send out the YouTube link to the recording of this panel um, and I highly recommend watching it. it. It is like lengthy, like an hour. An hour, 15 minutes. You can do it in chunks, but it, it's... But I think it, it, there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom in there. I can, I can also send you the transcript. That would be wonderful. Yeah, the transcript would be wonderful. Um, so I, yeah, I highly, highly recommend that, that video. And also Rabbi um, Sandra Lawson, what's her title now? Director of Racial Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Director of Racial, what did you say? Diversity, Diversity Equity, and Inclusion, um, who graduated a couple years before I did. Um, and um, among her many identities, she is a lesbian and she um, is black and she uh, has a very um, active social media presence um, and a lot of, I see like nods and yeah. some people follow her. Yeah, right. um, she also, I think, is a great person to follow if you're looking for practical pieces of advice on this topic. I have a question. Sandra, I've had a, there's a podcast called Hashivenu, Jewish Teachings on Resilience, and I created it in 2017. I needed it after the election. Yeah. and. Um, this year, Sandra is co-hosting it with me and we're focusing in on racial justice. And we recorded a, um, an episode on how to be an ally where I basically, I basically interviewed her and talked and reflected. It's really resonated. It's had, I think, about 12,000 downloads mm -hmm. and, and that's much shorter. And I'll send you that. That's, I mean, that you can either find that or that, that might be a good resource also. And um, one of the other speakers, Shana McKinney Baldwin, uh, who's a diversity educator up in, uh, she's the chair of our, our movement-wide Tikkun Olam Commission, which is working on racial justice this year. 
she was talking about there are certain metacognitive strategies that helps to kind of like undo some of the malignancies of systemic racism. And we're going to send that out more widely. She, she reeled them off very quickly, but, and she shared some of the research with us and we're in the process of um, making a, an accessible uh, sheet Thank you. So um, there will be lots of resource sharing. Sure. Um, and I just want to thank Rabbi Deborah um, for, she reached out to me. She was like, I'm going to be in Cleveland um, and I would love to do something. So thank you so much for reaching out. Thank you everyone um, who came. Uh, thank you to Rabbi Steve and Lila and Laurel for um, helping with all of the ways that you help and for Cool Love's co-sponsorship. Um, we would not have, CJC has never done a hybrid thing before and we would actually not have been able to do that tonight without Colette's help. So I really wanna um, appreciate that in particular. Um, we have learning to do there. It's, yeah, we did it so smoothly too. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, learning in progress, but uh, you're, certainly, you're certainly further ahead in that than we are. Um, and um, yeah, it, I welcome, uh, as long as I guess I'm willing to stay, <laughs> if people have more questions for, for Rabbi Deborah, um, to, feel, to feel free to ask them, but also feel free to go home, go to bed, do whatever you need to do for your bodies and your, your hearts and souls. Thank you. I want to thank you, Rabbi Miriam, for instigating this, this uh, gathering. Yeah. This evening. It's about like Charlie Citron Walker reading the um, man who ultimately took them hostage and whether that's the right strategy. He says he would do it again. I was very, very moved by that. The head of the Secure Communities Network, um, and I have had many conversations, he said the goal is not to be, you go to Europe and you have to, you, you, they don't, you know, they don't publicize the, 